the amount of people that thought I failed school because I went and worked with my dad thinking that it was a second option or they just thought, oh, you know, they're probably too lazy to study so they're just going to go work with their dad. And he just starts swearing at me and, you know, then started the racist slurs started coming. So everyone stood there, they stopped, they listened, but no one did anything. So I went into the sixth form and I asked them loads of questions about what do you think of construction? Some kids were like, oh, it's, it's for peasants. Construction is actually really a great job for women because we can apply our time management skills, our organisation, you know, construction is literally a massive programme and everyone kind of fits into it. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of the Brick by Brick podcast. My name is Hasha Kirai. I'm your temporary host for today. Our usual host is not feeling too good right now, but he'll be back soon. Don't worry about that. But it's not about me. It's about our very special guest that we've got today. And I think maybe a word or two that I could describe it with is uh, someone who's making waves uh, in this industry and someone who wants to get their voice out there and is making quite, quite a big change. And... Our guest, without further ado, is a senior project surveyor and public speaker, Miss Anjali Pindoria. <laughs> Anjali, how's it going? You all right? Yeah, good, thank you. How are you? Oh, good. Not bad, not bad. How's your, your journey? It's good. It's a bit, a bit long? Or where did you come from? Um, I came from Cannes Park, so not that far. Okay, so. that's all right. Not too bad, yeah. A bit yeah. cold, isn't it? It's a bit... Yeah, I was revising for my CSCS card test, so ah. yeah, it went, it, went, it went quickly. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. We wanted to get you on for a while. I think um, ever since we had this sort of idea to do a podcast, like to try understand our network more, get an insight into who we know. I think you were one of the first sort of uh, names out there just because of the things you do. I mean, I could have gone on with all the titles. I was like. going to say, it's too many compliments. You, you're taking me <laughs> back now. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. I'll just, I'll just, keep, it'll just keep coming. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, as, as in, I think the amount you do is always, it's always good to get an insight as well, and especially with how much you do. So um yeah, I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know you, um, what do you do and who do you work for? Um, so I'm Anjali, like you said. Mm. I probably need to change my surname now that I'm married. <laughs> my husband will probably have been like knocking on my door about that. But for now, it's going to always be Pandoria. Um, so I'm a senior project surveyor and I work for Avi Contracts. Um, for many people that don't know what Avi Contracts do, we're a carpentry and joinery subcontractor. Um, so we work for main contractors in the industry. Um, and yeah, we just provide our subcontract expertise on that. Nice. Well, good. So I think normally what we do with our guests is we just like to sort of like learn more about them before they are they are where they are right now, basically. And um, same goes for you, I'd say. So whereabouts did you grow up and like how was, you know, school life and things like that growing up? So I grew up in Edgware um, and I kind of grew up in not an area where there was a lot of community. Like all my cousins live Wilsdon Way, Kingsbury Way, and there was always a community um, around them. Whereas us, it was very different. Um, we had more Jewish neighbours who were very conservative, kind of stayed indoors. Um, so as siblings, we just kind of had each other, us four, if we wanted to do anything. So we kind of grew up as just us as a family, if that made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then my eldest sister kind of got into school at Kingsbury High School and it kind of just made it easier for my mom to do the school drop off. So we all ended up going there. Yeah. So that was yeah. kind of my first flavor of, you know, different communities, different people. Um, and that's kind of really where we grew up after Kingsbury High School. OK, no, that's good. So after Kingsbury High School, then you went to college and then I think is that's where the first sort of steps into construction sort of went is that um yeah so it's a bit different actually my um construction journey P people probably don't really know this but um i was doing my a levels at the time and you know everyone was kind of pushing me down go do accounting and finance but i really had a passion of going into construction more so because when we were younger the only way we could spend time with my dad was actually helping him on the weekends or in the evenings doing takeoff okay. so my dad would have all these big a1 drawings printed and he'd make it kind of into a game of okay here's the highlight is go find me this door number <laughs> yeah. or can you just hear some skirting um, and that's kind of where we learned basic construction. And he would say, OK, colour in around these like lines very carefully. Mm. And so we used to use that as a tool of spending time with him. You know, he used to bring work home. He'd have all these drawings up. 
on the walls and everything, like A1 drawings. And so we became really intrigued. And I really wanted to go into construction, but in school, they were kind of pushing me down the route of, no, you need to do accounting and finance, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I did my UCAS application, like everyone else. Apprenticeships at the time, people just were like, oh, what even is yeah, that, yeah. you know? Or you're too bright to let your future slide. That's what I got mm -hmm. told by one well of my done. teachers if I wanted to do an apprenticeship. And yeah. I was kind of like, hmm? Um, so anyway, went to Brunel University, um, did two weeks of accounting and finance. And then I got a call from my dad to kind of say, okay, we've decided you can come and join us. Um, they were very hesitant for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. um, more so because of the masculine um, industry that it is. They were a bit worried would I fit in. But at that point, I wasn't exposed to the bad side of construction in that way, mm -hmm. in the culture. I just thought, why are they not letting me do what I want? Why am I having to fall within society expectations yeah. uh -huh. and norms? Um, so yeah, then I literally, within an hour, handed in my withdrawal statement, <laughs> like, you know, was packing all my stuff up, yeah. kind of just said bye to all my friends. I was hustling in the library to sell my books. So I could go to <laughs> H&M to buy workloads because I'd never been to work before. Oh, okay. um, and at that time, I just thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. Um, and then that's how I got into my H&C. So it was kind of the next call was someone from work was like to me, oh, by the way, on Monday, you're starting a H&C in construction. I was okay. already late by a month like entering mm -hmm. i started my first day and then the next week i had an exam so well it was massive changes yeah, for me yeah. in my life that were just like all coming in at once yeah. um and that's kind of how i got into the h and c really oh well damn and how how was it was it like a big shock to you like even though you sort of used to work with your dad on the weekends and stuff like that the whole theory side of it was it a big shock to you like sitting down in a classroom and learning about it it, it wasn't a big shock, but I think for me, it was what I saw my dad do in terms of carpentry and joinery was very different to what the construction world really is mm -hmm. and how much more there is out there. Um, I think the biggest shock for me was I had to mature very quickly. Um, okay. All my friends were going off at uni, you know, enjoying a different kind of lifestyle. Yeah. I had to make sure I was up in the morning, you know, going to work, had to think about annual leave now. Mm -hmm. There was no six weeks yeah. of holiday yeah. or <laughs> half terms or, yeah, exactly. you know, freshers weeks and whatever mm -hmm. have you. So I had to grow up very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. I had to realize about working with different people, especially men. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest thing and okay. change in my life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, really that's, that's why I did just grow up. It's quite <laughs> interesting, yeah. So after, I guess, college, so you went to uni, you came out of it, went into college, and now you've gone back into uni I to do your- I went back to uni, yeah. Okay. So did uni for like two weeks, um, doing accounting and finance, yeah. then went to um, do my H&C at College of Northwest, mm -hmm. um, London. So that was a two year course, mm -hmm. all part time. So I was still working okay. four days of the week. Yeah. The other day I was going to college um, and then I ended up transferring that into a degree. Okay. But that was the hardest transition um, for me personally because it was such a massive shift um, going to uni in general, but to join a, a five year part time degree three years in like into the third year because I had already done two years H&C. Okay, yes, so yes. I kind of jumped into the third year of a five year part time course. Mm -hmm. Lot to take in yeah, that yeah. <laughs> and, and function. But I kind of joined halfway through a part time okay. degree. Yeah. And yeah, mentally, I was going through quite a lot. You know, you still have that expectation being an Asian kid, I think that you need to achieve, you need mm -hmm. to get the highest scores. But juggling all of that with work really, really took a toll on me. Okay. Um, and like, you know how life happens, things happen. So mm -hmm. that was probably the biggest shift for me. But again, had to mature again, yeah. even though I thought I had matured. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, with work, there's always issues and this, that, the other, like with the environment I was working in. So yeah. that was a big change too. Okay, so you did, what was the course in uni? Um, so I did a quantity, quantity surveying, surveying yeah. and commercial management. And then you went straight into becoming an assistant quantity surveyor for Avi, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. This feels like so long ago <laughs> now. But how, long yeah. it, how long has it been? I've been working for 10 years oh, now. Damn. So okay. yeah, so f um, five years ago, I would have finished all my studying and so on and okay. so on. And yeah. just been working ever since then. Okay, cool. So I guess Avi has always been the only company you've worked for full time. Yes. Pretty much. Do you, is that always sort of the end goal becoming because your dad is the director right is he he's one of the directors one of the directors yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's sort of like a family business yeah. i guess is that has that always been your end goal to sort of i'm, I'm not saying are oh, you gonna go somewhere <laughs> else and, uh, no uh, no yeah. no i think for me it's always 
you know, finding your passion and staying with it. And I really enjoy working with mm -hmm. Abby. I'm not just saying that because it's a family business and yeah. so on. I've been here for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I find myself in a position where I can make change. I can keep developing a business. I'm learning different skill sets every day where I was when I started off to where I am now, um, especially when you work in a small business, um, you kind of become an all rounder naturally. So you learn different 100%. things and then you can apply that into your daytime life. Mm -hmm. So what things I learn maybe financially in a business, I can then take into my own personal life mm -hmm. um, and learn those skill sets there. So in terms of end goal for me, it is an end goal, um, but I've never seen it as, you know, an ultimatum, should mm -hmm. I say. Oh yeah, no, I get what you mean. I think it's similar with me, I guess, um, where after after uni, I went to work with my dad and stuff and I was one of those guys, I didn't know what to do. Like at A-levels, I just did business because it was just easy and yeah. it's just it's just general, it's just, you just do it. And then uni, I did business and finance and, and then I ended up in a construction company and I was like, it, it was all right, it was good. It was good for a couple of years. And then I thought, I've not experienced the whole world so I thought, let me see what the world's got to offer. So I just went, I worked for like someone, um, I worked for an energy company yeah. and I worked for a software company, both actually really good companies, like the way they, their culture is and all of that. But I think it took me two years to realize uh, when I was working for my software company, it was a really good job and I, I'm not gonna lie, but I think I realized then that why am I here like sitting and doing work to make money for someone I don't really know? Like, obviously it's great, as in I'm not absolutely thing with nine to five, but I've got an opportunity rather than making money for someone I don't know and making a bit of money for myself, I could just be making money for, for my dad. Like, why yeah. not? Like, do you sort of share that I do motivation kind of, as well? Because like when I started working, it was kind of mu very much, you're not just fending for yourself, mm -hmm. the, you're fending for your whole family. Exactly, yeah. And like, I saw my dad from a young age fending for us mm -hmm. and that kind of put those principles into me that yeah. you know you have to work hard for your family mm -hmm. and the fact that I can see you know my mom enjoying life after she's done so much for us um I just it just makes me have that much more motivation to mm -hmm. want to work harder yeah. for my family mm -hmm. knowing that they'll be able to live a much more comfortable lifestyle if I do better in my work exactly. so when you're working outside in the nine to five you're not thinking about oh it's work you're thinking right you know you're giving back to someone mm -hmm. But going back to your point about you doing business and stuff, I think it's really interesting because a lot of, you know, our parents have businesses and a lot of children probably take it for granted or see it mm -hmm. as, or even the community think, oh, they're just going to work for their dad. Yeah, yeah. Initially, when I went to work for my dad, the amount of people that thought I failed school because I went and worked with my dad thinking that it was okay. a second option or yeah, yeah, they just up. thought, oh, you know, they're probably too lazy to study. So they're just <laughs> yeah. going to go work with their yeah, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one actually knew I wanted to make a profession mm -hmm. out of it because okay. people don't know what yeah. construction has to offer, for mm -hmm. example. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, people don't realize like, you know, working in the family business it shouldn't be seen as like a negative thing. It exactly. should see be seen as a positive thing, you know, yeah. you're taking over what they've created and that legacy. So mm -hmm. I think it's really special. 100%. And going on to that point of sort of um, people not knowing what sort of opportunities there are. So, I mean, if we haven't established it already, you're a woman in construction, which makes you a small subset of people, to be honest, which isn't, which, which shouldn't be the norm. We, we want to sort of, you know, make it more equal yeah. and things like that. A lot of people don't know the opportunities that are there in construction. So, um, you know, for example, like if, let's say I go to someone, anyone, and I say, I work in construction, a lot of them would say, oh, are you a plumber? Are you a carpenter? Are you, you know, are, are you getting dirty? Are you doing physical work and, and things like that? People aren't really aware of, you know, that, that there's so many other opportunities in construction. And the thought of doing physical work can put people off, to be honest. And that's why, not, and not just women, it's, it's men as well. People can just get put off. They would rather maybe sit in a heated office maybe all day and just on uh, sitting down and doing work, which is also just as important. But what sort of opportunities are there as well for not just women, but men as well, that they, they might not necessarily know about in construction? So I'm gonna ask you first, how many, how many jobs do you think there are in construction? How many job roles do you think there are? I mean, off the top of my head, I could probably say, just like guess a number. 10, 10 to 15. 10 to 15 jobs. Come on, think about it properly. There's actually 182 job roles in 182. construction. 182? Yeah. Well, by like titles, but you know, yeah. in, in terms of like, if you broaden that out, there's probably so much more, but according to like um, 
you know, CITB and stuff when uh-huh. you go on their yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, job finders, there's actually 182 jobs. Oh, damn. Yeah. And this is the thing. Nobody knows about construction opportunities because of the culture that we're set mm. at, or seen. Like the first thing that came to your mind was plumber, carpenter, etc. Yeah, yeah. More so because those are people you think about when you see domestic construction. Mm-hmm. People don't think about large scale construction. Mm-hmm. So there's so many opportunities um, in construction, um, even if you want to sit behind a desk, etc., or you know you want to do outdoors things, but people just aren't educated about it. Mm-hmm. And I think until we actually educate people about those job roles or talk to them about it, then they're not going to really know where those opportunities come from. But there's so many tools out there online um, that you can use to kind of look for those um, and tell you more about the 182 <laughs> job roles, I should say. So cool. that's good. And it- and it's, it's quite a big, quite a big shock to be honest. 182. But why should a woman look at a career in construction? Like, w- what is it about construction that is so fulfilling? I think for me, it's what our end goal is, right? So I always give people the analogy of when you go to the doctors or the dentist, mm-hmm. whether you go to A or B, they're both going to provide you the same service, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to yeah. either help you or tell you what you need to do or what medication you need to take, so on, so on. Same like in construction, you can go to company A or B, but the end goal is always the same. Okay. And the way I see it is we're here to create, you know, buildings that are gonna outlast all of us as humans. And I think that's just so special. Like, although I've only been working in this industry for 10 years, I go past so many buildings and I will always be like, oh, I remember that. Yeah, or yeah, there's so you. many memories that yeah. that one building holds yeah. in just building it. Mm-hmm. And then imagine how much more of a legacy and memories and stories it's going to create for the people that are going to use that. Mm-hmm. And sure. the way I see it is like, especially through the pandemic, we personally were working on hospitals and stuff. Okay. It was just that drive of, I want to work here because it's giving back. So whether you're a female, male or anybody, I just think the purpose of working in construction is so much more fulfilling and rewarding. There's so much you can do. And not, it's such a cliche in our mm-hmm. industry, but not every day is the same. 100%. It's like yeah. every day there's something called the other. Mm-hmm. So I just find it really energizing that what I used to do ten like five years ago is not the same 10 years down the line now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's always evolving, so. Uh, I, and picking up on that, I was gonna ask this later, but it actually fits in quite quite good now what is your day-to-day like stuff what what is a day-to-day <laughs> how long do you have <laughs> <laughs> i know every day is different of yeah. course but what generally makes up a, a, a rough day so my predominant role is to look after the commercial side of the business so if we're working on buildings etc we have a contract mm-hmm. um i have to just make sure that we're doing the works as per the contract and then i'm applying for that money um as and when we have interim payments and applications mm-hmm. due Aside from that, I kind of get involved in everything else. So I'll go on site and I'll review like project management side of things. I'll also help with the procurement, um, you know, making sure that meetings are in place, Mm -hmm. that what, for example, every job I do, I kind of have systems in place that I kind of use all the time. So I'll have work matrices. So I'll have a floor plan. Mm -hmm. I love highlighters (laughs) and markups. So you'll always see me with that. Um, And I just love to see progress. So I analyze all of that then I can analyze that in, are we good to complete the job financially? Mm -hmm. And then I can do my reporting better that way. Um, The other thing I love to try and do in my day to day is learn more, um, learn from the next generation and also the past generations. Mm -hmm. Because we have so many carpenters out on site who are, you know, maturing, should I say, in a nice way. (laughs) Um, And they want to now go off and enjoy whatever's left of their life. Um, And so I think that, knowledge that they have is really invaluable Mm -hmm. and unless people like us the next generation and you know us in the middle um kind of go on and and get that knowledge then we're not going to be able to progress okay and as you've progressed because you were like an assistant um quantity surveyor quantity surveyor now project surveyor senior project surveyor has your has your time changed what 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 did you prefer did you prefer maybe were you more free before like, did you have more spare time I don't really before? believe in titles, to be okay. honest. Like, um, we, we as a business have never really believed in titles. But I think because when you work for big companies, they like to see a name mm-hmm. behind something. Yeah. The way yes. I see it is everyone kind of does what they need to do at the end of the day. That's yeah. what I've seen myself do. Mm-hmm. I've not seen myself, you know, change in any way because of a title. I think I've just taken on more responsibilities Mm -hmm. or felt more onus to give back a bit more. But in terms of my role change, I don't think I have. I think (laughs) think I still do everything the same, just 
hundred times faster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I get exactly what you mean. I think for us as in us as a small business, like I guess the title I've got is marketing, but we're still like, like loading the vans in the morning, dropping the guys to site, I know. ordering materials. It just becomes all one title. People look at me confused when I'm offloading vans and they're like, are you sure you're okay with that? I'm like, you don't know <laughs> what I've had to do in my lifetime. I was on site yeah. once and we were like short of laborers. I had mm-hmm. to just chip in and like take all the floorboards yeah, off. Just... And they're just like, oh, are you sure you're right? Yeah. I was like, yeah, mate, if a job needs to get done, it needs to exactly. get done. It just has to be done 100%. Yeah. And a lot is all riding on, on that. hands on deck. Exactly. A lot, and a lot's riding on the prep work and whatever has to be done, so exactly. it's got to be done. But I guess um, going back to the sort of women in construction bit more, um, let's say there's someone young watching this who's you know not sure what they want to do, or let's say there's someone elder who wants a career change. What can they actually do themselves? Like What steps can they take in order to get into construction themselves? I think first of all, um, I would say there's tools out there online to, to tell you what your day-to-day lifestyle would suit in terms of a job role um, in construction. And I always send people to those tools. Um, so like on the CITB website, there's like a career finder. Okay. So because there's so many roles, you might be really confused after looking at all of them, oh, which one do I wanna do? Mm-hmm. But the questions that these tools ask you are, oh, do you prefer staying in or going out? <laughs> it's, it's just general life questions. It yeah. narrows then down the career options for you. Oh, okay. And then you can then decide, okay, I might be best suited for X, Y, Z. Uh-huh. Then you can then go off and research those and then kind of see, is this something I want to do? The way okay. I see it is with any career that you want to do in life, always brainstorm. I'm a very, you know, um, I love pen, pen paper and stuff mm-hmm. and I love seeing things down on a piece of paper. Yeah. So I would say brainstorm what it is that you want to get out of, not just life, but outside of life. Because then you can look at a job career and say, okay, will I be able to do my life balance? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, do my extracurricular things. Um, but if anyone has an interest in construction, I would say like reach out to people you might know. Because I think the biggest thing that we don't do is ask people questions when we're young. Yeah. We don't ask someone, oh, what is it that you do? Mm-hmm, definitely. Especially young people, they just yeah. think, ah, they just go to work. Exactly. But what yeah. is work? Uh-huh. So yeah. I think do a lot more work experience when you're young too. Mm-hmm. Work experience really showed me that I didn't want to go into accounting and finance. Okay. And yeah. I did one week in accountancy practice and one week in a bank. And that kind of secured for me, I didn't want to do it. <laughs> Whereas okay. if I hadn't done that, yeah. I would be probably, you know, sitting in an yeah. accountancy <laughs> firm somewhere doing an AAT yeah. course or something. Yeah. But I think work experience is key and speaking to people who are in those industries. Mm, definitely, I agree. And I think working, I guess employment as a whole is a two-way street. It's up to the, the the employee themselves to find where they want to go or the student or whoever they are to find where they want to go. It's also, I, I would say that companies also bear a responsibility about trying to get more women in, into construction. Do you think companies are, are doing that at the moment? I think now because there's a lot of conjecture around the topic and there's a lot more people that feel they have to fill quotas. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes it can be seen in a negative way right right now what companies are doing, but there are certain people who are actually thinking now that we need to break this culture. Mm -hmm. So they are doing things actively. Um, The way I see it is it should be a natural thing, not just because everyone else around you has a female in their business now, you feel like you just need to shoehorn one in. That is what I'm totally against. Mm -hmm. But if you feel like you're looking for a candidate, then why not look at females, um, you know, as just as, males but again it goes back to the culture Mm -hmm. of do females even know jobs exist so if you don't have an applicant applying for that job how how are you going to be able to take them in Mm -hmm. um but yeah employees definitely need to do a lot more to support women Mm -hmm. um you know if i didn't have the support of all the guys out on site in our business looking out for me yeah. i probably would have had even more worse incidents and stories okay. to be telling yeah. but a lot of them knew me because it was a family business so i was quite lucky they knew me okay. from when i was young yeah so no one saw me in a way that other people might have seen me out on site okay. and that really protected me yeah so just getting onto that point about challenges as a woman you face i mean of course we, we want to make things more progressive and get more women into construction but life's not all sunshine and rainbows so Mm -hmm. what have what sort of challenges have you faced personally so the way i see it is as soon as i started this job whether i knew it or not i was always carrying three bricks on my back Mm -hmm. one being that i was a woman one being that i was a young person um because there's not many young people kind of emerging and Mm -hmm. also because of my ethnicity um there's not 
that combination that is out there too often. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the first initial years when I was working, it was all fine because I was I was doing a few site visits here and there. I was always with someone. So I was always, like I said, protected. And then as I grew up, um, I then started going out to sites by myself. Um, and these are large construction sites mm -hmm. where not everyone can be controlled. Not everyone's gonna understand or, or learn, yeah. etc. And then we got this job where I had to be on site for like most of my week, basically. So for about two years, I was basically on site all the time. Okay. And I got put in like a cabin full of all men who yeah. were subcontractors, which I had no issues about. But again, that made me mature and put on this kind of more macho kind of thing. Okay, yeah. But growing up, because I was always a tomboy, I always okay. had conversation with men and, you know, it, I was okay about around being with that. But it was one day when I was out on site and um, the client was walking around and I knew that this was gonna happen. And I saw a kind of a fight break out. So I thought, right, the client's around. We can't have people having mm, an argument, mm, yeah, whether it's our staff or other staff or mm -hmm. anyone. So I kind of just went over and was like, guys, 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 the client's walking around. And at that point, one of the guys who was fighting then started abusing me. Okay. So wow. this was in a hotel. So it was already narrow corridors mm -hmm. um, and he just starts swearing at me and you know then started the racist slurs started oh, coming oh, yeah wow. but what the difference for me was nobody came out of the room to actually help me they all came out just to see what was going on so everyone stood there they stopped they listened but no one did anything okay and then at that point someone one person came from from our company and he told the guy you know back off sort of mm. thing um i was okay and then i went down to the cabins and then that's when I let it all out. And I was just like, what actually just happened yeah. to me? And then it was when the site manager came and then he just said to me, oh, well, do you know what? I'm really sorry that this happened to you, but you just need to get used to it. And oh, that wow. is when I thought, right, I need to be a voice here yeah. because how can someone be told that? Yeah, exactly. And it was actually quite funny because after that, I then started taking up Taekwondo <laughs> because I felt like I needed okay. to, you know, be able to protect myself. Mm -hmm. I've had so many more incidences where I've been in a hoist with a hoist driver mm -hmm. and it was very uncomfortable. Oh, I won't okay. talk too much yeah, about yeah, it. That's no worries. But no worries. yeah, so I've always felt like I now have um, a reason why I need to protect other people, mm -hmm. especially women. And I just feel like even now, like I'll be walking around site with my brother. Mm. Nobody knows he's my brother. Okay. I, uh, like if I'm walking around and yeah. stuff. And then the other day, one guy was just like, oh, are we having a party here? And I was, it, and then we were like, no. And they're like, oh, I want one girl if you're having one girl. So it's comments like that. But then it, it's just like, why are things like that really unnecessary? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the reasons why I just feel like I need to protect more women out there and mm -hmm. be the voice, which is why I've taken the onus of carrying those three bricks, but also trying to erase those bricks as being things that people are looked at rather than the interior. You know, I've always mm -hmm. said it, what you do at work should be what takes you in your career. Yeah. Um, and I wanna come to a point where I'm not really talking about you know, inclusion and stuff mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Um, and I don't want people to know me for all of that. Mm -hmm. I would rather people know me for my work yeah. and what we do as a business rather mm -hmm. than, oh, could you help us with an EDI thing? Yeah. You know, I'm all for it right now, but until we get rid of that, we're not really gonna address the yeah. issues because we we'll still be talking about yeah, it. Yeah, hundred percent. So, what is it that you do for women um, in terms of getting them into construction yourself? So, I've taken a step back in the last couple of years, um, and I've really addressed and looked at what is it that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I can go and speak at all these events and stuff, but I always find I'm kind of preaching to the converted. So okay. now I've taken a bigger role in doing STEM activities. I feel like until I speak to, you know, young children and change their perceptions, we're not gonna be able to bring a new culture into construction. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be that change that has to happen. But until we bring more of the young generation in who are not tolerant to this behavior, yeah. who, see it in a different way, um, you know, and just won't put up with any of this now, um, you know, we're not gonna change the industry. Mm -hmm. But 100%. I'm not talking in the industry in a negative way because I also see it from the other side as well. A lot of men have never had to work with women. Mm -hmm. And the way yeah. I see it is I've always been treated as either the wife or the daughter because that's the only two yeah. kind of encounters mm -hmm. that men have with women. And so I always see it as, need to try and educate them as to how to work with females. Um, you know, 
especially cultures, we have so many diverse people mm -hmm. from around Europe and around the world that come and work yeah. in construction, but mm -hmm. you've never seen a female work yeah. in um, construction. So when I'm walking around on site, people look at me, but I have to always see it as maybe they're just intrigued as well to mm -hmm. understand what yeah. it is I'm doing. Yeah, definitely. So with the STEM stuff, what is it? What is STEM? And you're an ambassador, right? For it. Yes. So what, what is STEM and what does, what is your role in STEM as an ambassador? So um, STEM um, stands for science, technology, engineering and maths. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole aim of STEM ambassadors is to go into schools, colleges, universities, um, you know, community groups and mm -hmm. talk about jobs and kind of educate children and young people mm -hmm. and profession professionals and even careers advisors as to what these jobs actually entail because Teachers are expected to know everything, but mm. they're not going to know all the 182 yeah, yeah. job roles in construction, <laughs> are they? Exactly. So yeah. it's our duty as STEM ambassadors to kind of go in. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, over the last couple of years now, I've kind of thought, right, I really want to make an impact on young kids. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is become a STEM ambassador. But for construction, there's, um, you become a STEM ambassador, but you also link your profile to what is called a Go Construct STEM ambassador. Okay. And that opens up more opportunities for teachers and these, you know, people who want you to go into their schools, mm -hmm. colleges, et cetera, to reach out to you because okay. your profile will show that you have expertise in construction. Oh, okay. And so what you do is you've kind of got a portal, mm. um, the teachers, et cetera, will put out like an advert to say, we're looking for someone to come and speak um, about X, Y, Z. Can mm -hmm. you be, are you interested? You kind of exchange information with each other and this can happen in person or even virtual, okay. which is brilliant yeah. because the way I see it is sometimes in my lunch hour, I can just go and speak to yeah. school kids. Yeah. And like, you know, you're giving back. Mm -hmm. To, to so many people, but virtually you can reach millions, right? Yeah, so yeah. so how can someone get involved with being a STEM ambassador? It's so simple, just sign up to oh, the okay. website. It cool. sounds so simple, like yeah. it sounds like so difficult or that you need to be picked or anything, mm -hmm. but you just go on stem.org.uk and then you literally just sign up. Um, okay. It is that simple. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the way I see it is everybody should have an ambassador within their business, mm -hmm. not just to help them, but as as an onus on us to change the industry into something better mm -hmm. um so yeah i hope you sign up now i'll, I'll yeah <laughs> definitely after that <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> but again going back to another thing is so you speak a lot at events and you know yeah. um conferences wherever it is it's actually quite like a it's actually a very important skill like try and get myself public speaking it's not the easiest thing um but it, it is pretty tough and i was i was just doing some research about something and I think the National Social Anxiety Center said that 73% of people have a fear of public speaking. It's actually quite, it's actually quite massive. Like a, a majority of pop, of the population have a fear of, of public speaking. It is scary here and there, but, and it's not something common which a lot of people get into. What made you get into public speaking? So at the time that that site incident and stuff was happening, mm -hmm. um, I was also writing my dissertation research. Okay. Um, and when I, because I'm because I always wanted to get ahead of my work and you know uni and stuff because I had work and everything to balance mm -hmm. um I started prepping the summer before I went back for my final year of uni okay. so I went and had um, a meeting with my um tutor who I wanted to be my dissertation tutor at the time and I said to him how do I make my dissertation you know like how do I prep for it how do I do good in it etc so, etc et like what topic should I do mm -hmm. and he said you need to think of a topic that's going to go beyond these four walls he goes, you need to bring identity to it. You need to do something you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And with everything going on in yeah. my life at that time, I thought, right, I'm going to write a dissertation mm -hmm. on why young people are not coming into the industry. Okay. So my dissertation research was done. Um, I was really, really getting into it. The more I was researching on it, I found myself being that dissertation mm -hmm. okay, because yeah. I was that person in that research. You know, mm -hmm. I did, I went back to my high school and I actually did research on, on those school kids. So I went into the sixth form and I asked them loads of questions about what do you think of construction? Mm -hmm. And that triggered me, the responses okay. I would get was getting. Some kids were like, oh, it's, it's for peasants. Oh, this, wow. Yeah, oh, kids at sixth form age, yeah. you know, who are, who are nearly 18 were, were seeing construction in like such a low school. Mm. Like yeah. I think it was um, as much as like 80% of them said they would, their parents would probably be more proud if they were a pop star or a celebrity than a construction oh, worker. Okay. Oh, wow. And I just thought, wow. Yeah. So I did my research and then my dissertation tutor 
later on after I finished said, there's an opportunity for you to present your research mm -hmm. um, at so-and-so event. And I was a bit like, okay, this is a bit scary, hmm. but that was my first opportunity to do public speaking. And okay. that's how I got into it because of my research. Mm -hmm. So because I went and did a, a, a talk there, um, that's how I kind of really got into it after. Okay, how many have you done? How many public speaking events? I don't know. I don't keep count. <laughs> so so there's, <laughs> there's, there's, that yeah. there's that many. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. A ballpark figure. Oh gosh, I don't know. Hundreds. N not hundreds. I'd say quite a few. Okay. I yeah. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> What's the biggest event? Do you remember the biggest event you've spoken at? So I don't really see it as like big events for mm -hmm. me it's whether there's one person sitting behind mm -hmm. that you, you know that that chair or whatever yeah. it makes a big difference to me mm -hmm. i mean i speak about that first opportunity i got from my dissertation yeah. research and if it wasn't for that day and those 10 people that were in the audience mm -hmm. at the time you know i i went in thinking oh there might be a good 30 people or so yeah. um and only 10 people turned up. And mm -hmm. at that time I was thinking, okay, out of the 10, I'd invited my dad and my <laughs> my uncle and my kaka at the time, and yeah. they were there. And I just saw them sitting there and I saw them like welling up. Okay. I saw a different oh, nice. side of them and see me mm -hmm. having matured. And I think yeah. that was a big validation for them to see that the opportunity they gave me, you know, meant something. Mm -hmm. um, but all the, but going back to my point, sorry, I digress that's a right, lot. All those 10 people in that room then gave me an opportunity to go and do another presentation mm -hmm. or get involved in something else. Yeah. So yeah. for me, it wasn't about it being the biggest one, but it meant the most to me that night. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of probably the biggest scale I've done, I've done like a university graduation ceremony. Oh, nice. So I did um, wow. South Bank Center actually. Yeah. Um, and that that's about just shy of 3000 people capacity so every time like I, just, I, I know you've done a lot but does every time bring a new challenge do you feel like oh here we go again or are you just click done no head, head i get really get nervous it? before yeah oh, okay. i'm probably part of that 73 <laughs> percent, but i just really don't show it um but yeah i i always get really nervous um i always have to hype myself prep myself mm. beforehand i have I'm quite like, you know, superstitious in that way. Okay. I have yeah. to have a routine. Okay. So before I go on to do any kind of speaking event or whatever, I have to pray. Oh, okay. I have to, nice. I have to like have my headphones in, mm -hmm. have to tune in. Um, I love listening to music. Mm -hmm. um, and like f from a religious point of view, I like listening to Kirtans mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. Nice. Um, so I always have to tune in, listen in, okay. get into a zone and yeah. then that's how I do a presentation mm -hmm. because I can still hear that in my in my ears. Uh, okay. If that makes sense, I, I can mean. still be in a zone where I'm in a bubble. Mm -hmm. So when I go to present, I'm in a zone of this, 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 this. Okay. So I know what you mean. Breathing helps me. I mean, when like even I know exactly what you mean. Like I've presented to like ten people, and then sometimes it's like I don't know a hundred people, or sometimes it can be. I've, I think I've done like a thousand or two thousand. Wow. Um, that was by accident because of like people online and stuff like that. And <laughs> I, just, I just counted those numbers in. Accident, but, yeah. Accident, yeah. Um, but uh, I feel like breathing helps me a lot. I think box breathing, I, I don't know if you heard it, like you just hold in for four seconds and then breathe out for four seconds, breathe in. No, sorry, hold your breath out for four seconds and then breathe out four seconds, hold it four seconds. So it's just it's just this const constant cycle. I feel like it helps me a lot. I think it gets my head sort of uh, in check because your your head is the biggest enemy with with everything you just mm -hmm. you tend to overthink things and you just send you just go down this like negative slope sometimes and you beat yourself up, up about it so. it's funny you say that because the first couple of presentations i did were kind of just off the back of that one opportunity that i didn't mm. think would lead to yeah. so many mm -hmm. um and because of that if I made a mistake when I was speaking, mm -hmm. I would constantly have that in my mind yes, and yes, I'd be yes. thinking about it and I'd be like, oh my God, why did I mess up on that line? Because mm. I used to try and present without notes. Okay, so yeah. I would try to learn everything in my head, um, you know, have it all up there. So mm -hmm. if I went off topic or piece by accident yeah. or missed up that messed up that sentence, yeah. I would be eating Con myself just, just up. Just replaying it in your head. Yeah, yeah. but I've, I've learned to now not over prep. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because I think sometimes I used to like get annoyed at myself yeah. when I didn't get it perfect. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people would be like, no, it was fine. What yeah. are you talking about? Yeah, and I'd be yeah, like, exactly. no, 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 I messed up. Mm. 
I, but, it, but I guess it's just a high standard, and you, you you've got, which yeah. is good. It's always good to have high expectations with everything as well. Yeah. But, you know, with um with doing so many sort of uh, public speaking events and things like that, I guess each time you would have learned something to coming out of it. Have you got like a few tips and tricks for people that maybe want to get into public speaking or people that currently do it and maybe a, l a little tip or trick here and there can help them out? So I've actually picked up a lot of tips and tricks from other people. Okay. Um, so um, I met a few BBC news presenters once okay. and I always and I, and I asked them, how, how are you preparing all the time to be mm -hmm. so amazing on screen? Yeah. They said, we don't over prep. So that's ah, when I okay. started cutting out the over prep. Okay. And they said, whatever you're going to be presenting on, make notes high level um, and then just talk it through in your head. Mm -hmm. So what I now do is before I do any kind of presentation or so on in the morning, whatever I have to talk about, I will write high level notes out just okay. so that I've got it in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen it written because I'm quite a, a visual person. So yeah. I can take visual pictures. So if I've seen it or written it on my hat, okay. uh, on a piece of paper, yeah. I'll, I'll replay it. The other good trick is prepare before, obviously. Don't over prepare, but mm -hmm. talk to yourself in the mirror. Yes. Present to yourself in the mirror. Yes, yes. It's very uncomfortable. Uh -huh. once it's very weird. It is. Weird, and once yeah. you've done that, you'll pick up your pace. You know, um, also talking of pace, try and look out or, or go on YouTube and do different like vocal exercises. Okay. So, you know, the way you want to convey a message, if I'm talking slowly, you're listening. Yeah. If I'm talking fast, it could come across as aggressive. Yeah. So it's okay. how you tell your story, mm -hmm. how you want it to be conveyed, okay. is how you make a bigger impact. Yes. Okay. No, I like that. I'm going to take that on board 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how, how important do you think the skill is of public speaking? Because like we said, no one wants, a lot of people don't want to do it. Like even the thought of people even doing it, they, they, they get scared. I remember at university, I had a group, um, like group work. You always have to do group work. The dreaded group work. Always yeah. have to work with people that you don't know, or maybe sometimes it doesn't work out. But I would, I was working with a group of about six or seven people and we had to do a presentation in front of a camera and one person. Now I, I'd have done, I'd done presentations up until this point. I wasn't overly confident, but I was like, yeah, cool, let's just get it done. We'll do it bish bash bosh and we'll go home. But they were just like, like frozen. Like, they were like how, how are we going to speak? I was just like, you're speaking to one person, yeah. which is fine. I mean, people have that fear. So how important do you think is the skill of public speaking? I mean, I just mentioned like presentations at uni, but you know, how important is it? I think it's really important because it helps you to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, public speaking gives you that confidence. So it helps me have confidence outside of my life as well. Okay. In, in other scenarios, it helps me in my work mm -hmm. day to day, you know, approach someone new, network with people, yeah. which is really key to mm -hmm. developing not just your businesses, but also yourself. Um, if I wasn't confident enough to go and speak to X, Y, Z outside, I probably wouldn't have got xyz opportunities yeah. outside myself mm -hmm. so you have to try and push yourself it's not for everyone um you know and the world isn't made so that we have everyone public, be public speak. speak yeah of course because there's also a power in listening yeah. but i just think if you try and learn some of those skills then it will help you in your life outside as well mm -hmm. um and definitely communication 100 percent. but again if you don't like public speaking think of a bubble and just try and block everybody else out and just mm -hmm. present how you would rehearse in front of the mirror. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. I've not done the mirror, but I've, I just speak to myself when I go for a walk. So I put in headphones just so people think I'm talking to someone, but I'm just talking to myself. That's a really presenting. good one, actually. Because it, it, it just it just works. I guess sometimes I, get, I, I can time it. I can be like, because you know when you're on the phone, you pace around. Yes. And I've got the opportunity to pace around because I'm going for a walk anyway. Yeah. So I, I just tend to do that and it helps me out. I pace up and down in the house yeah. or if I know I have to have a time presentation, PowerPoint kind of times you. Yeah, it's got that. So yeah. I, I, I time myself on that. Okay. So yeah, but yeah. timing is very key as 100%. well. Yeah, you don't want to overdo it. You no. Can't, you can't exactly. underdo it. Yes, yeah, it's so important. And with public speaking, there always has to be, we always have to get the other side of it. Um, has there been any funny presentations you've done or any mishaps? Um, I wouldn't say any funny stories, yeah. but... I try not to have mishaps. So for example, like I said, I kind of tune in with like listening in or whatever. Mm -hmm. So if I haven't been able to finish what I'm listening to, yeah. then I've already told myself, oh, it's going to be bad. <laughs> so I have that mishap of, oh, okay. so I have to make sure my routine is done mm -hmm. and finished before I present. Okay. Otherwise, 
I feel like that's going to be a mishap. So <laughs> yeah, probably shouldn't overhype myself <laughs> in that sense and just go with it. But I do. So going back to the sort of EDI thing now. Mm -hmm. um, so diversity is one of is one of the letters uh, which EDI is uh, what it represents. And I was thinking about diversity in the construction industry, and I was I was thinking to myself, I was like, I've been on site quite a few times. And I see a whole load of diverse people there in terms of like races and stuff like that. I, I work with a lot of Indians, Asians. Um, you know, I, I see white people there. I see Eastern Europeans there. I see black people there. And it seems a very diverse bunch. So is is there a diversity issue? And if so, what is the solution for it? I think there is a diversity issue. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we wouldn't all be still talking yeah, about it. Yeah. But um, we have diversity issue in the sense of People from our communities and cultures and um, the BAME communities mm -hmm. are normally seen in more the skills sets okay. um, and the skilled trades. Yeah. But now the next generation coming in, the parents don't want them to be hands on. So oh, I yes, know a yes, lot yes. of people, mm -hmm. um, especially in the school research that I did um, for my dissertation when mm -hmm. I was talking to you about when I was asking the kids, why don't yeah. you want to be in construction? Mm -hmm. A lot of the people said because their dads were tradesmen yeah. and their dads are actually influencing them to then not go into the trades mm -hmm. because that's all that they see. Yeah. Whereas if their dads had influenced them to go in, but said, go look for the professional mm -hmm. roles or, you know, trades are changing now. It's, you know, we have so much technology that supports these guys out on site now. Yeah. It would be a different thing. So we've kind of lost that generation because of the influence of okay. those that are in. Yeah. Um, I mean, the statistics show that we're like less than 6% of, you know, BAME individuals in the industry. But again, oh, it wow. goes down to culture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's changing, it is. Um, but the point of changing goes down to the word education. Mm -hmm. I say it all the time. Mm -hmm. If we're not educating our own parents, our community groups who are seeing this as, you know, not an opportunity or an industry for their children, um, we're not going to change that. And culturally, the reason why these groups are not coming in is predominantly parents and home influence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think education is really key there. Is that one thing you provide in order to improve the diversity with uh, in in this industry? So I try to go talk to, you know, at careers events where parents are invited okay. because I can challenge them direct on mm -hmm. to say, you know, they, they might have, oh, it's not a good career path. It, you know, you can't earn any money or yeah. there, there is an X, Y, Z protection or whatever for, for, for my children in this business or, um, you know, in this sector, should I say. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're there hands-on kind of myth busting, um, they can't really say much back. Yeah. So I think it's always about myth busting to communities. Um, and yeah, that's really key. Okay. So I guess another part of being more equal, being a bit more diverse is people with disabilities. Now, of, of course, it's not easy to live with a disability and to find work having a disability. And I think construction is, is probably maybe one of the more harder industries to get into if you have a disability of, of, of any sort. So can can companies do a bit better with getting people in who have uh, disabilities? I definitely think so. Um, I think there are so many provisions that can be made out on site or even in your office. Mm -hmm. um, we've come across quite a few people. Um, well, I have in my last 10 years of, of work. Um, and I know a lot of people who have disabilities that are seen and hidden mm. um, and, you know, they're doing well with it. Um, but for example, out on site, if you have someone who might be deaf, for example, you can put up more signs, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. for sign language, mm -hmm. you can you can put up more sirens and stuff like that for the fire alarm so that it's more seen. Okay. You can make yeah. that person known through a toolbox talk. So mm -hmm. if something were to happen or there was an emergency, then, you know, everybody knows who that person is yeah. and they can ask for help. So there's a lot of technology out there as mm -hmm. well that can support these people with like the um, audio replay um, okay. and that works yeah. quite well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about giving those people opportunities, but also promoting it. Yeah. You know, if people don't know that they can have those opportunities or that those things exist, then they're, they're not likely to come forward. Yeah. Um, but I think we as an industry probably need to do a lot more mm -hmm. to make those provisions clear. 100%. And I guess the next place to sort of uh, move on to is um, when I was doing like research on uh, LinkedIn, <laughs> I think that's the best place because <laughs> I didn't need to go anywhere else because like your LinkedIn Facebook page then, is like isn't it? 100%, yeah. 100%, 100%. It's like the Facebook of 10 years ago where everything... Exactly. You, you know, when I made my Facebook account, I put all my details on there, you know that? I put oh my, my address, I put where I, where I live, oh my um, God. Where, where I was born, everything. 
And then I got a quick call from my sister saying, what are you doing? You need to take that, take that <laughs> off. I like, but I digress. Um, on your LinkedIn page, there's like, it, it's just full of like amazing it's like stuff on there. How important is LinkedIn for you? Because you're very, very active on there. And like, when I, when I look at my feed, it always says, oh, Anjali Pindore likes this or Anjali Pindore is tagged that, in. That's something. a bad thing, no, no, isn't it? No, a good thing. It's a good thing. Your, your name's out there, of course. But, you know, what's, what's, what's the good thing about LinkedIn and why is it, you know, increased so much in value over the last few years? Well, firstly, I think if I could remove my name, I would remove my name on LinkedIn <laughs> so it didn't come off as much and just have the message that I want to mm -hmm. get across. Um, I know the value that it adds to people. Um, because it tells people what opportunities there are out there and what people can be doing to to make positive change. Mm -hmm. So for me, LinkedIn isn't about getting my name out there, getting Avi's name out there, mm -hmm. or just having my face constantly pop up. Yeah. It's about the message behind those things. Mm -hmm. It's about making people aware of what's going on. Yeah. So you probably wouldn't know so much about what I was doing in construction on EDI mm -hmm. or you know the things I was involved in like STEM. Yeah. And you wouldn't be thinking about it unless I posted about exactly. it. So for me, exactly. it's I need to get that message out there. Mm -hmm. um, and the power of LinkedIn is that it, it just works like any other social media, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. like nobody needs to be on it for too long, but yeah. they can do enough to then see and trigger. Um, you know, only now am I seeing dots being joined between all industry bodies. Like um, I'm quite heavily involved in like the CIOB. Okay. I help CITB with their STEM stuff. Yeah. But now when I'm going to all these meetings or like working with these organizations, they're all saying, oh, we should be doing X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Then I kind of overlook at it and I'm like, everybody wants to achieve the same. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to help them all just come together and say, guys, why don't we all work together? Mm -hmm. um, and it helps collaboration. 100%. Yeah. Has it, have you seen like physical change? I mean, um, especially in the women in construction, but is there, what's the statistic like that? Because I, I guess the I guess the numbers don't really lie. I mean, the yeah. numbers under, are, are the underlying thing, the percentages and everything. Has it improved? So I know you say numbers don't lie, but no one's ever asked me if I work in construction and I'm a female, so I never know how I've been added into statistics <laughs> unless the LinkedIn stalking. <laughs> so I always find it crazy that these statistics exist, which are great, mm -hmm. but can I physically see a change? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, so yeah, I know that's that true. that's going up. Mm -hmm. So five years ago when I did my research, the percentage was about 13% female, mm -hmm. whereas now it's about 14%. So okay. statistically, it's gone up 1% in yeah. five years. I would probably think that it's probably gone up a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I just feel like if if people are doing more positive things and adapting a more positive culture, yeah. then then that will, you know, inevitably um, revert into numbers, basically. Mm -hmm, 100%. So another part of your LinkedIn page is uh, the award and accreditations. So I've just looking at it. I just had to scroll and scroll oh and scroll, the amount of awards <laughs> that were there. So like, it's embarrassing. I mean, but okay. how, how come how come it's uh, embarrassing? Like, do you not as in is it not like, doesn't it feel good when you win an award and I when mean, your hard work is has got something there. It don't get me wrong. It feels good to be recognized and stuff. But for me, it's like people have made it into like an Instagram like, you know, getting okay, that buzz yeah, yeah. from getting an award. But for me, it's the buzz of the work is being recognized. My voice is being heard. Mm -hmm. That representation is being seen. Mm -hmm. And I just think that when I win an award, I'm happy but I'm happy because it means that we're one step closer to abolishing conversations of EDI yeah. mm -hmm. because it's being recognized on a platform. Now with awards and stuff, they're all brilliant, but I just feel like, you know, we shouldn't have to be validated through materialistic things in life to, to show that we're changing mm -hmm. and that we're doing positive things. But for me, it just validates that work is, you know, moving up there, you know, people then see you in a different light as mm -hmm. well because yeah. um, you've got an award yeah. um, but it just makes me feel like okay my goal mm -hmm. means that people are going to be more aware of what I'm doing yeah. because I've got an award and they want to know what I do mm -hmm. so it helps me get my message across oh, okay. so my end goal is a bit different yeah. mine is more message 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 mm -hmm. but without the award um, I guess I can't go up in that so what's actually physically been like the biggest change or wow that you can actually see or oh, wow we're making a change here i think for me is maybe just looking inside in our own business when i started apart from you know the the, the accounting team mm -hmm. who are basically family as yeah. well um i was the only person that came in as a female into the business 10 years ago mm -hmm. in a professional should i say capacity yeah. or, or a professional role but now we've kind of changed that 
um, you know, we have another two people mm -hmm. in our business and we've had someone previously as well. Okay. So for me, I just look internally, I think, wow, the change that it's made in those 10 years mm. is, is just amazing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that for me is quite a big validation. I guess taking it back to on a personal sort of level. So my sister works for us and um, she's the office manager. She does. She's so important to, to the business. She's been there for about more than two years. She, she knits everything together, all the yeah. sort of the, the site work and all the paperwork. Everything's just knitted together by her. We asked her one time, he's like, do you want to start doing some damp surveys or, you know, step sort of away from the office? She was like, nah, why would I do that? And I was thinking, like, if if you have time, you could do it. He's like, nah. So, what sort of mindset needs to change? Not from just her, but from from people who have that mindset. Yeah, you're trying to make me uh, convince your sister. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> it. Get, get her up. Get get her some more service. Get her some more jobs. No, I think I think the biggest change is you need to try it. Mm -hmm. Until you try something, you can't say never yeah. or no. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like you have to be bold and brave to to, to, to try something, mm -hmm. especially if it's out of your comfort zone. Yeah. If I wasn't bold and brave enough to go out there and face sight again after all the things that occurred to me, mm -hmm. I probably still wouldn't be sitting here today. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to just carry on is the way life goes, yeah. isn't it? You know. But if you're in an environment where you've got that opportunity, I feel like you should try it. Mm -hmm. If you still don't like it, then fair enough. Mm -hmm. But you would probably love it. Yeah. And, you know, not just saying this, um, because I'm a female, but females have a different set skill set to, to men. Mm -hmm. And especially with like project management and things like that, you know, we can apply things much better. So construction is actually really a great job for women mm -hmm. because yeah. we can apply our time management skills, our mm -hmm. organization, you know, construction is literally a massive program yeah. and everyone kind of fits into it. And if you're able to manage that the same way you manage your life mm -hmm. uh, on an Excel spreadsheet, basically, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you can actually add a lot of value and it's much more fulfilling and rewarding as a job. Mm -hmm. um, in our business, we've been able to see a massive change because in the last 10 years, we've seen many more women kind of follow into okay. the business. Yeah. And that's because, you know, the directors have been open to, to allowing women to come in mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing that it worked. Okay. You know, a lot of people yeah. are a bit hesitant because they're like, oh, we don't know how it's all going to work. Mm -hmm. They have to start thinking about, you know, all the other things that come when you employ a female, yeah. which mm -hmm. they've never had to before, yeah. um, which isn't their fault because we're all a self-taught industry, mm -hmm. especially as subcontractors. Yeah. You can ask your dad, for example, <laughs> everything they did, they, they learned yeah. on, the on the job and they had to adapt. Um, but in the last 10 years, we've seen many more women come into our business mm -hmm. who are so eager to get out on site. Okay. When you're That's in good. an office role, you bet you can apply your job and what you're doing much better when you've mm -hmm. been out there and you've seen it. Okay. So I probably wouldn't be able to do my job as well as I did if I sat behind a desk. Mm -hmm. I could yeah. because someone could be feeding me the information, <laughs> yeah. but I wouldn't be able to apply it as well. Okay. So, yeah. Your sister should definitely try it. Hundred percent. <laughs> <laughs> we can get more jobs. Go to give yeah. me a call. I'll push her onto a site. <laughs> <laughs> Even with that, like I mean, I mean, can whoever's watching this and wants to get involved, they can just message you. Yeah, on definitely. LinkedIn. And yeah, LinkedIn, or um, even if they drop you guys a message or anything like that, happy to share my details. But yeah, I'm always there to kind of help and mentor young people because I've always wanted to be that person that I wished I had when mm -hmm. I was younger. Yeah. Uh, again, another cliche, but you know. I just wish I had somebody there mm -hmm. to kind of guide me yeah. or just, you know, we find ourselves in a really busy life that we don't have time. Yeah. 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 yeah? 100%. Oh, I'm so busy. That <laughs> buzzword. Is yeah. it because you're busy or because you don't want to prioritize that or you don't want to find that driving you to help people? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've always got time for people. Okay. I was, I was just about to ask that because, because you do so many things. Like, do you actually have spare time? Like, <laughs> You've listed so many things, yeah, and you just, it, I don't know how you have the time for it. Like, how do you balance, like, everything with, like, home, family, work, all this volunteering stuff? Like, yeah. how, how do you knit it, everything together? Again, good on Excel. <laughs> <laughs> My life is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, no, um, it's about balance. Right. It's about when, it, when to say no to. Um, I think the biggest thing for people is to say no sometimes. Mm -hmm. But there's always, can I, can I come back to you in a few months? Yeah which we don't use often enough. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like people think that they just need to do everything now, now, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, it's about having a structure, having a routine. Mm -hmm. If I know that I can make time or have, you know, things lined up how I need to, then I can do everything that I need yeah. to do. 
it's just about managing things and being efficient as yeah. I can. Yeah. And it helps with like a good family, good husband, everything. Yeah, just, yeah, just, uh, that that helps. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess sort of like moving on to the sort of away from the professional side now. So um, the way we, we, we know each other is from like our community sports tournaments and yeah. all of that things. Unfortunately, you guys take a lot of the trophies <laughs> re in recent history but it's fine no worries um we're, we'll aim to get get back up there again Team Abby. <laughs> <laughs> but um i was i was i was actually it was quite refreshing to see that because you, you it was quite evident a few years ago or, or even before that that you would like as in you or your family avi would sponsor the team mm -hmm. but you weren't just sponsors you were there helping out giving instructions or showing passion <laughs> i was like damn this is this is mad and and now we just had a tournament recently where i went there and in our community there's so many under 11 girls just playing playing football and just under 16 girls and i was this this was like uh, this was nothing this was there wasn't even a, a tournament for, for for this age group or this or, or for the girls yeah and now it's just become this massive thing where it could probably overtake the boys in in, in a few years like Think they probably would probably will to, yeah. to be honest where, where does your passion for like sports and things come from because again just like construction you're part of a small subset of people and in sports as well a little bit women aren't you know forthcoming with i want to yeah. do sport or you know sort of thing so where does your passion for sport and things like that come from again my passion for sport has to come from my dad right. <laughs> really Fair enough. um you know growing up being part of four siblings, hmm. my two eldest siblings are, are girls, hmm. um, and then I have a younger brother. Yeah. So my brother used to always be like, oh, come in the garden, play with me. Mm -hmm. My older two sisters were just too into, you know, all the other girly <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. So from a young age, I became a tomboy because okay. I had to be a brother yeah, to my yeah, little yeah, brother. Yeah. Um, and then I knew like that was a bond that I created with him by playing mm -hmm. sports. Yeah. Probably breaking too many things in the house <laughs> as well. Sorry, mom and dad. Um, <laughs> couple TVs, couple frames. To, to be fair, we used to probably like do so many things that were like yeah. hooliganism, I should say. <laughs> But my grandma used to help us cover it all up. One <laughs> There's time, always one, isn't it? One time we one. broke the bed by jumping on it. Oh, damn. And then my grandma, I was going to call her Bar, but mm, my grandma, yeah. she literally just got from the saris to tie the string. <laughs> she got all of that and she goes, okay, quickly tie it together. <laughs> so she used to help us get out of so much trouble. Um, I digress as well. But yeah, going back to my passion for sports, mm. it, it came from my dad really. Again, it was another opportunity for me to spend time with him. Yeah. Um, and then I found sports a way to bring people together. So when I was in primary school, um, you know, I used to play a lot of sports. Again, it used to bring me closer to people. But then when I got into high school, I used to want to help give back to young kids. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that I could do through sports. So when I was in like year nine, I went and volunteered at the local primary school during my lunch hour. Oh, nice. So okay. what I used to do, though, was we got the bullies and the kids that were being bullied together to play sports. Oh, nice. So we made okay. them work as a team, yeah, yeah, but yeah. they didn't before. Okay. Um, and then from then, it really triggered sports for me as mm -hmm. a way to help people with personal problems mm -hmm. or issues outside so then when I got much older um, at school I opened a Sky Sports Living for Sport um, program for girls who felt like their you know looks the mm -hmm. the weight they had like personal problems um, okay. just to help them gain self-confidence yeah but again through sports so oh, okay. some of these girls had never done any sports before yeah but it was a way of helping them you know break barriers mm -hmm. I talk about Taekwondo helping me break my inner barriers mm -hmm. and you know yeah. disciplines and things like that so sports has always grown as a way of a coping mechanism you know people mm -hmm. go to the gym to let off steam yeah, right 100 yeah so it's just such a beautiful thing mm -hmm. i think um and then yeah that's really really helped me Definitely. that's how i got into football a lot as well are you a are you're a united fan right yeah united of course fan. yeah it's been a tough couple of days it well, has it has right. you like cricket as well yeah would you would you rather have may united win the champions league or india win the World Cup. Oh no! Now, now you're playing with <laughs> two playing things. with fire. <laughs> you are. Um, I'm proud Indian, so India. I know. India, yeah. yeah. I guess Champions League is every year. One day we'll get there. Yeah. Thing is, there's that passion that I find in football when United win, mm -hmm. but when India win, it's something like you just feel like doing it for you're for the home. You're proud yeah. for the country. I know yeah. what you mean. Is is that yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like because. You're Indian, you have every reason to support them and it's just like... Yeah. yeah. It doesn't happen mean. as much, so I get that buzz from football, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, what about you? What would you pick? 
probably pick I'll probably pick United. I don't know. There's something. There's something about us. My dad's like, probably going to hate me for saying that, but <laughs> I think I'd probably get told if I said uh, <laughs> United. I think I think all the struggles we've had over the last ten years makes you more of a fan. It's like absence makes the heart, heart grow fonder. The absence of success. Yeah. It's just maybe like you know what. I think I said support the team even more, and it's just like the next time something comes, just, just like say savor it in. And whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, we're on the part of the podcast where we get our signature questions. So obviously the the podcast is called the Brick by Brick podcast, as our new lovely sign. Hey. Goes <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously bricks are a big part of a structure, the foundations, and so many bricks make up a structure, a whole structure at the end of it. But what is the most important brick in your life? What is the most important foundation that you have that's made you, you? Mm. There's two in my life, but... You can have two. I can have two? Sorry, right. you can have two. One is definitely God. Mm -hmm. And one is definitely family. Mm -hmm. um, like my immediate family. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be able to do what I do today without their support and them being a very strong pillar. Mm -hmm. um, like my husband, he does a lot for me. Uh, a lot behind the scenes that yeah. a lot of people don't know about. Yeah. But with that, that support, um, even my mum, like even just the things that they do or have done, mm -hmm. you know, is very important. Mm -hmm. But then I couldn't be where I am today without God yeah. and having that constant pillar throughout all my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I met my husband at a later stage in my mm -hmm. life, but there's always been that constant of God for me. There's um, someone there to back you. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Always. Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, even if I'm in a room alone, mm -hmm. I've got God. Yeah. Yeah. So, 100%. yeah, biggest foundations for me are, are those two things, I think. Yeah, family. And I think, like, going back to our first episode with, like, my dad and stuff, and I think the reason why a lot of people were watching it, I, I think it's because everyone has a similar story to him where every dad or mom, they have this, like, struggle through life and they just go through, they almost go through hell and back just to provide for us, yeah. for us kids. And the least we can do is give back to them. Exactly. Pretty much. So that's what yeah. I've seen. No, Parents grafting for us, and yeah. so now I feel that onus of trying to give back to them mm -hmm. in yeah. one way or another. And I, f I feel like when you value family, then it, it 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 sort of transfers into your life where your work takes a bit more priority, your family takes a bit more priority. Everything you do, you do it at a hundred percent. You don't you know slack off because they didn't have the chance to do that back yeah, in their days. Pretty definitely. Much. So yeah, no, that's quite interesting. God and family. So um. We told you to bring uh, one object of value, which yeah. uh, a personal value to you. So what is that? I really struggled with this one, actually. Yeah. Um, I think if you had asked me a couple of years ago when I was in like high school, mm -hmm. I would have probably bought something very material with okay. me, yeah. like, or, you know, something designer or something yeah. that, yeah, I, yeah. that <laughs> it has high value. Because yeah, yeah. I'd have been like, oh, this is great. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to get jacked for that. <laughs> but like, I, was, I really, really struggled with this one okay. because I just thought, I, would I actually be sad if that? like got lost or something mm. that will like so i'm trying to detach myself from material things yeah. but the one thing that i do keep quite close to mm -hmm. me is um a picture of my family oh, on nice. the back of my phone okay um and i feel like if someone was going to jack my phone i'd say at least give me the picture <laughs> give me the picture just give take me the, the picture. simple take, take, take everything you want <laughs> off of me just give me my photo um yeah. and that's how that put it into perspective for me um i know it's a picture and i've got them in my mind or whatever but having that constantly if I'm having a bad day mm -hmm. or you know I just just need to look at something to remind me of why I'm doing what yeah. I'm doing mm -hmm. kind of flip it and then I'll see it and I'll be like okay it's, it's good yeah. um but I feel like I sh yeah feel like I'm moving away from this life of materialistic things so then you mm -hmm. don't set expectations or mm -hmm. you don't have that attachment it's yeah. good to be unattached I think 100 percent. I feel you get that when you're when you're older I mean when I was young 100 percent. I was like I really want this to happen. Like if I'm planning my wedding, for example, yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was 21, I was like, you know what? Yeah. I know, I know who I'm going to get married to. I just, my, my wedding, yeah. It has to be the you best. You had to say that now. I, to, I, <laughs> I, have say, I have to say it now. <laughs> but I just... um, I have my, like my mandop's going to be the, the top, the best. The decoration's going to be the best. My centerpiece is going to be everything. Um, The camera guys are going to do the craziest creative shots, whatever. I think as you get older, you just thought, you just think there's a bit, there's a few more important things in life, and, and I'm not Definitely. saying oh oh here I, I'm a I'm I'm not material or anything. I no. want it. I want a sick wedding. I want a good wedding. Yeah, hundred percent. But I feel like as you get older, you mature, you surround yourself with the right people, i.e., family, yeah, um, good friends and stuff. You sort of you know that that message comes in you where there is more to life than material things. Yeah, even 100%. even for me, it's material in the sense of 
you know, like you said about the awards and stuff, mm. it's a material thing for yeah. me, but it's what is that message portraying? Mm -hmm. So for me, yeah, sometimes you do need to have certain things yeah. or look smart. So mm -hmm. you have to have nice yeah, clothes and things yeah. like that because you need to, you know, be a certain way, but mm -hmm. all come across well. Um, but it's what you feel towards that after. Yeah. Um, you speak about weddings. My my wedding was a COVID wedding, 15, uh, okay. 15 people. 50 people. And that put it into perspective of yeah. that ceremony should be more prominent mm -hmm. than everything else going on 100%. around. And I was so blessed to mm -hmm. have a COVID wedding yeah. um, because honestly, it just made what the reason is of a wedding actually be more important. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, I was, I was living that moment with my parents, with my husband across me, mm -hmm. you know, and All the that, important people, the yeah, right people. There, there was no noise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was no noise in the room. Mm. There was no negativity. There was nothing. Mm. It was just us. And it just made that that ceremony be the most beautiful ceremony yeah. of my life. Yeah. So although I was questioning, why is this happening? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I was very, very fortunate. So 100%. big man backed it. <laughs> <laughs> big man backed it always. Um, yeah. And just the, the last uh, sort of signature bit we have is yeah. we have a... We have a little question bowl here for the viewers at home. This is our question bowl. And uh, just a whole bunch of uh, quick fire questions. You can pick one out and whatever you right. pick out. And just, just put the top one there. Give us an insight that we might not have gotten from you. <laughs> What's the question? It says, tell us your best scar story. Oh God. I can, I can see by the laugh you've got something. Yeah, well, when you have uh, three up. siblings, you know, there's always some scars <laughs> to be had. Um, so my best scar story actually has to be, um, I was helping my brother one time, we were little, mm -hmm. by the way, um, and I was helping him with a shoe box or something and he thought I was getting in the way and I was interfering. Yeah. So he actually pulled me back and because of the height, the only thing he was close to was my stomach yeah. and he just went in <laughs> and, and bit me. <laughs> he actually bit me <laughs> on my stomach. And then I was like, oh, that hurt. So I looked up and I was like, and then I ran to my dad. I was like, dad, dad, <laughs> he's bitten me. <laughs> it was, it, my dad probably just thought, oh my God, get on with it at that point. Um, but yeah, that that is the best scar story. I still even have scars on my face because of the amount of times that we've got into fights. Scraps. Yeah, scraps. Damn. Just over, yeah. just sibling rivalry. Just sibling rivalry, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've got lines on my, ma on my oh, face damn. still, yeah. yeah. How old yeah. was he when he bit you? Was he like 18 really, or something? Really, oh, okay. really, young, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Vishnu, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> cool, and that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, thank you for coming. It's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure having you, and I'm sure everyone at home uh, enjoyed it as well. No, thank you. No thank problem. you for hosting as well. No problem. It's been great. No problem. But I did want your brother. Ah, I'm already right. joking. <laughs> that's the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> I'm already joking. That's all right. It's all good. It's all good. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, this has been Anjali Pindoria, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks.